Good morning and welcome. Um, I'm, my name is Kate Grimm. I'm a rate analyst with the HSCRC. We're going to begin with Shu Lei discussing updates on the UCC policy, shared savings, revenue at risk, and market shift, and then end with a discussion on the update factor. And as part of that, Jack Cook will be calling in to discuss his different statistics. Do we have uh, folks on the phone today? Yeah. Should, do we, uh, should we go around and just uh, um, uh, introduce ourselves? Uh, so um, we'll start over here. Barbara? Barbara Bravado. And you'll have to turn your mic microphone on so others can hear. Good morning. Barbara Bravado. Good morning. Dion Joyce. Helen Engler. Jerry Smith. Dominic Hemser, HSCRC. Sure to get over to HSCRC. Uh, Bob Murray, representing Care First. John Hamper, Care First. David Johnson, Sibson Consulting. Albert Blumberg, representing the Maryland Radiological Society. Patricia Roddy, Medicaid. Paul Parker, Maryland Healthcare Commission. Ed Veranek, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Hank Franey, University of Maryland Medical System. And do we have some folks on the phone? Stan Dorner and we have Mike Robbins on the way stuck in traffic but he'll be here shortly so so um, if you remember in the last meeting we couldn't get to the agenda items so we switched the order so we want to cover some of the other topics first and then get to the update factor um, it's a full agenda so I, I thought that I'll walk through the slides. If you have any clarification questions, please stop me. Otherwise, um, I think it will be beneficial if you do the discussion at the end of the presentation. So the first topic that we wanted to cover is the uncompensated care policy, UCC policy. Um, as, as you're all aware, um, HCRC has a provision to uh, cover the cost of UCC, um, which includes both bad debts and also uh, charity. And this is the worst policy for me to pronounce a lot of the, um, <laughs> so I'm going to use the UCC instead of the, so um, the, um, the key here is the provision states that the HSCRC covers reasonable levels, so we still maintain the incentives to have efficient collection um, processes at the hospitals while maintaining the um, equity between the hospitals. Um, so this is um, chart shows the trends in the UCC from our financial audited data. Uh, what you see is the dramatic decline in 2015 to 4.7%. Um, in 2014, we had some declines, um, but as you know, the expansion was lowered in 2014, um, and the declines are really happening in 2015 um, fiscal year. To, um, in general, what we've been doing is we are using the historical data to project what will happen in the current and the future fiscal year. Um, since the ACA was expanding uh, in the past two years, the Commission took prospective reductions to the UCC, even though we didn't see those declines in the historical data. Um, so with that, in 2015, we estimated the reductions using the, what we call PAC population, primary adult care population. These folks were um, having benefits from the Medicaid, but they didn't cover the inpatient stays. Um, so those were automatically enrolled starting January 2014. Um, so using CRIS patient identifier algorithm, we were able to match these folks um, to our hospital data and then estimated what was their UCC levels in the historical time period, and then the UCC prospectively were adjusted from 7.23 to 6.14 in 2015. In 2016, um, we expanded this analysis and included the Medicaid expansion uh, folks, um, did a similar analysis and reduced the uh, fiscal year 2016 level to 5.25%. Um, now we are thinking about fiscal year 2017, so this is the third year um, that we will be doing 
post-ACA um, UCC determination. Any questions on that? Um, so this is the, so that's the statewide uh, picture. And when you look at the hospital level differences, obviously, um, the trends are different um, depending on what your level of UCC before the ACA started. And here, what you could see is, you know, Bon Secours, Midtown, where we had very high level of UCCs. You see dramatic declines for those hospitals. And, and the, the um, changes are mixed depending on um, where you're located and what kind of patient mix you had in the state. So this graph is showing 2014 and um, 2015, and ACA kind of happened in the middle of 2014. So while working on it, um, last year, commission started uh, collecting account level um, UCC data so that we could do more detailed analysis. Um, and the first clean year data that we have is fiscal year 2015. Um, and there are some reporting lags, so they don't really match the financial data for the same period. Um, but in general, um, the, the data that we collected um, took a while to clean, but right now we, we, we think that it's a good data for us to be able to do the analyses. So I wanted to give some summary statistics from that data, um, and this was presented two, um, two months ago at the commission meeting and in several other meetings. Um, so we took this account level data and matched our hospital level data to look at the proportion of UCC. So what you have here is by payer, the source of UCC, and as you see, the 32% of the total UCC is from charity and self-pay self -pay patients. Um, what you see is the commercial and the Medicaid has another 25% of the total UCC, with Medicare with 13% of the total UCC in the state. In the next slide, um, we are looking at the percent of write-off in the patient bill versus percent of write-off in um, the total charges. So the red here is the percent of the bill. So if the patient goes in, if you're a self-pay patient, 92, on average, 92% of the bill is written off. And, and this will make sense if you think about the self-pay uh, patients um, not being, being able to pay the, the total bill in general. When you look at that red on the commercial, um, that's 14%. So on average, 14% 14 of the bill is written off. Um, so you could think about this high deductibles and, and, and co-pays that are in that percent bill written off. Uh, on the Medicaid, it's again 14%. For Medicare, it's 8.7%. And the other is high, but if you remember from the previous slide, other bucket is really small, 5% of the total UCC. Um, so then the grades are how often, um, it's a combination of how often um, the account is written off as well as what percent of the bill is written off. So for the South Bay Charity, 93% of total charges in the state are written off. Not only we are writing off higher percentage of the patient bill, we are also writing off a lot of the South Bay Charity patients. Um, on the commercial, you see that that is at 3.4%. So 3.4% of all charges for commercial is written off. So this is the, you know, we are reading off 14% of the bill, but that, there are not that many people um, at the end of the day, if you think about the total charges and the services provided to um, patients with commercial insurance. Yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Medicaid, what, what is that? Because we don't have co-pays, we don't have deductibles. So what, are, what are you writing off? So we've been doing back and forth on that. Um, some of it is an issue with the reporting of the payer. You know, they think it's uh, Medicaid eligible. At the end, they are not eligible, which falls into this. But also, um, some of the Medicaid accounts for the out-of-state Medicaid, um, Delaware, Virginia, where um, the Medicaid programs in those states are not paying the um, HSCRC rates, but paying their own rates. That goes into this analysis as well as uh, part of UCC. Um, and thirdly, hospitals indicated that even though um, the patient may get the Medicaid coverage, there's still uncovered benefits 
um, which I'm still trying to understand what those are. It could be that historically maybe Medicaid is not covering something prior until they get. Um, so it's kind yeah, of... Yeah, or I, I don't know, for the uh, undocumented folks, uh, sometimes you cover part of a bill and not an emergency room visit or yeah, something like that. they're not eligible so. for those services. I just think it's kind of, maybe it's misrepresenting what um, is truly written off by Medicaid. It's just that they're not eligible for it. They're only eligible for certain benefits if it's while they're, you know, um, while they're covered under Medicaid. They're not eligible for full, full benefits. So mm -hmm. probably kind of misrepresenting the, in, in terms of the data that we write those services off. So you could think about this Medicaid eligible population, not necessarily Medicaid covered patients. Um, but the, the we looked at the pending issue, and it is not about the pending Medicaid. It seems to us that um, hospitals are recording these patients as Medicaid, and uh, you know we are still trying to understand what that means. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think we should dive down because it's. it's we don't have deductibles. We don't have. Right. It, you know, we're not writing things off if they're undocumented, yes, they're only eligible for emergency, but that doesn't mean that we're writing off. They're just not eligible but, but the for hospital Medicaid. But hospital would write off. But it, but it, it, so it's it, 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 it partially, but it, it's partially self-pay and partially uh, covered in some instances. So it's, it's the same as commercial. Uh, the commercial is partially self-pay and partially covered, and, and, and so it's a different rule set, but it, it, it is uh, it, it's starting out as a, some, some, something that somebody was thinking was a Medicaid patient. We can talk about that afterwards, but I do think we should be shifting some of those costs into the bucket. So this always, so what we are trying to do is the primary payer, so, and then if you just add everything self-pay, a lot of the hospitals for the commercial and others, if the patient is paying, they bucket it into the self-pay, but we really truly wanted to look at the uninsured as a self-pay rather than what the patients were paying um, and trying to estimate the expected payer. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss more. Um, there might be some cleanup to do for the Medicaid expected payer, uh, but in general, um, even though patient may have a Medicaid coverage, there is some uncompensated care associated with those patients either due to timing or due to the uh, covered benefits for those patients. So if, if there was no payment at all, you move them over into self-pay. Right. So if there was no Medicaid payment whatsoever, it got put over in the self-pay. So what's left there are things that were partially denied, not denied, not, pay, not allowed. So these are actual accounts where there was some payment from Medica Medicaid or uh, coming in on that patient. Um, uh, so it, it's, a, it's, it's basically it's saying that we would expect that about a 5% write-off on things that were truly Medicaid because of partial disallowances by the Medicaid programs, um, whatever that means. So that's basically what it says. It's not, a, it's not saying that it's um, a bad debt from the patient. It's saying that that you didn't cover or somebody didn't cover part of the bill, and therefore it's showing up as uh, uncollectible. It's it's charity care. It's charity care. So when you look at the location, um, as you may expect, um, the outpatient is 63 percent of the UCC in the state with 36 um, percent inpatient. And we are looking at the chronic um, beds in acute care hospitals um, for the first time with this data. And, and you see we were able to look at, um, at 4.3 million in, um, for these type of patients, excluding Bayview, which we weren't, we weren't able to match. Um, and similar analysis, when you look at the percent bill versus percent total charges, on the inpatient side, um, almost 15% of the bill is written off on average from the patient accounts, which is equal to 2.5% uh, total inpatient charges in the state. On the outpatient, the percent um, written off is much higher, close to 30% of the bill. Um, and on the chronics, um, it's 
kind of in between inpatient and outpatient. Um, so with these trends, um, the UCC policy for 2017, um, we are focusing on post-ACA period. As you see, there are dramatic changes in the UCC level, so it is not um, appropriate to be able to do a three-year average trend that we used to do in, in the policy. Um, so the payer source type of service are um, still strong predictors um, based on this data. Um, since we have now account level data, rather than doing a hospital level regression, um, we are looking at account level regressions to be able to predict the UCC amounts at the patient level and then sum them up at the hospital level. Um, so the, the importance of the regressions is, as I explained, the reasonableness amount. So we are trying to find a way to look at the average right of amounts for each hospital if they have the average practices in the state and average uh, patient mix um, of the state. Um, and with this, um, as I came in Donna's um, answer, the undocumented immigrants um, is growing in the state and, they, uh, and we don't have a good way of predicting them yet, so we are looking at alternatives um, to look at the um, undocumented immigrant uh, UCC levels. Oh, they, should, they should be in self-pay. if. Uh, so it really is uh, when you have a self-pay category as part of your predictor, that is a pretty solid way of coming up with a, 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 an allowance for the, the patient. Yes. Uh, building on that statement, if I understood the discussion that just occurred, we provide through Medicaid emergency services for undocumented individuals. So if the patient, and since the majority of admissions are through the emergency room, if John Doe comes into the emergency room as an undocumented alien, uh, has the emergency room visit covered by Medicaid and then gets admitted, does, he, does his admission continue in the Medicaid bucket and then becomes part of what gets written off? Or does his admission uh, then revert to self-pay because, you know, he doesn't have insurance and whatever. I mean, what bucket does that individual appear in these statistics? I don't believe they get any coverage if they get admitted at all. I think they only get the emergency room coverage if they're outpatient only. I don't think That's what I'm saying is so, if so we, we I, moved I, them over to You would move them to self-pay. They wouldn't stay in, in Medicaid. Come into the self-pay if there was no cash coming in on the account. But there could be some right. issues with uh, I think OB and, and uh, emergency room were the only two areas of coverage. Right. So we so it, once they get admitted, they're not emergency room. They're inpatient, and they don't get any coverage at all. From That's what we researched last year, and I believe that's correct. Um, so once we do the regressions, the current policy is to do 50-50 blend, what we predict using the statewide analysis with the actual reported in the hospital um, financials. Um, so with that, the, um, what the policy would require for 2017 is to reduce the UCC provision from 5.25% to 4.7%. Um, that will be effective July 1st, 2016. So I just know. A quick question. Uh, the regression analysis, does it include, um, um, it used to only include Medicaid and does it include commercial now in the regression analysis to predict? And so the regression, what we are looking at is the area deprivation index. So if you have a commercial insurance, um, the amount of write-off would still depend on your socioeconomic or your income or your employment status. So rather than putting a commercial as a predictor, what we are trying to do is to get at the, that socioeconomic determinants of the UCC. And we are kind of in the early stages of looking at that data. Um, the area deprivation index is quite predictive, actually, whether you have a, a write-off or not. Then how much written off from your bill, then we are taking into account whether you have a commercial or whether you have any other policy. So you're looking at payer mix when you come up with the write-off in the first place. Right. And then you're adjusting the write-off levels based on deprivation. Is that kind of? So we, we've been looking at two alternatives. One is to do what we call the counting model. 
and that will depend on percentage of your payer revenue. So if you have a self-pay, let's say hospital has 10%, and since 90% is written off, that's the multiplication of the two. And if you apply it for the commercial, you'll do the same. So that's accounting model on average, depending on the percent of revenue by payer. And the other model is at the account level, we are trying to predict what the um, predictive probability of a patient getting a write-off. Mm -hmm. And there, ADI, Area Deprivation Index, is a predictive of whether you have a write-off or not, in addition to whether you have a self-pay or not, uh, whether you are inpatient or outpatient. So we are putting all those in into the model to predict whether a patient will have a UCC or not. But then the amount of UCC is driven by the policy. So, and here, again, you may have a high chances of a UCC at 90% if I am self-pay. But once I have that, 90% of my bill is rich enough. Again, in another patient, I may still have a same predictive 90% uh, chance. But if I have a commercial, then my bill is written off at 14%. All right, any other questions, comments on the UCC? Do you want to say anything? All right. So we're, uh, we're, are we going to have a model at the next meeting? So the, yes, uh, you'll see the models. And MA, I am sorry, I, I, MHA has been very um, helpful. So they are working with their technical work group in terms of the regression models. So as staff, we focus on the 4.7%, how much we are going to reduce the pool. And then hospitals and industry is working in terms of the appropriate model for predictions. Um, so we are collaborating um, with MHA. Uh, and I'm hoping that the models will be ready for the next meeting on May 20 something, right? In a couple of weeks? Right. Mm -hmm. So you could see the uh, hospital level results in the comparison of the two models. Um, so then um, the, the next set of slides, um, I try to do my best, try to get you a big picture on all our pay for performance so that you can put the shared savings and aggregate at risk into the context. So um, as you know, with the global budgets, um, the importance of these adjustments have increased. Um, um, the revenue adjustments that we do to the global budgets could only be either for quality measures or for mar market shift adjustments. Um, so with that, the um, um, the system, as we wanted to do, is moving towards more value-based um, payment adjustments. So um, in summary, we have these five different payment adjustments in the state. So QBR is quality-based reimbursement. This is very similar to the C CMS value-based purchasing. It measures process of care, safety, mortality, patient experience, so it has a um, very different domains in, wrapped into a single measure. And currently, um, there is a 2% maximum penalty under this program and 1% reward um, um, for the best performing hospital. The second program is MHAC, Maryland Hospital Acquired Conditions. Um, this is measuring potentially preventable complications. Uh, we are using, as you know, 3M product and measuring 65 different complications at the hospital. Um, and the maximum penalty here is at 3%, and the rewards are also set at 1%. If you remember, um, with the all-payer model, we had a 30% reduction goal for the complications. And in the past couple of years, we have increased the penalties in this program to, um, to achieve that goal of 30%. And um, with the second year results, um, we are at that goal already. Already, uh, so the um, the uh, maximum penalty was reduced in the last year from four percent to three percent. The third program is the readmission reduction improvement program. 
Um, so this program was first instituted with the all-payer model um, to incentivize hospitals to reduce their readmission rate. Again, in the all-payer model, we have a goal to achieve the national readmission rate by the end of the fifth year. Um, so this was a, a way for us to provide a payment incentive um, towards faster improvements in readmission rates. Um, and this program went through changes. Um, the first year, we only had a bonus of 0.5%. Our um, rate of improvement wasn't as fast as um, what we would like to have. So second year, um, we instituted a 2% maximum penalty, and we also increased the reward up to 1% um, for the um, calendar year 15 performance. The fourth program is shared savings. Um, this program started prior to global budgets, um, and what we've been doing is um, to, with the episode kind of payment that we had under admission re readmission revenue program, um, we've been having 0.2% total savings under the shared savings program. And last year, the discussions were that um, we wanted to focus on readmission still rather than expanding this program. Um, to have the readmission reductions incentivized even further. And lastly, with the global budgets, we have the potential avoidable utilization efficiency adjustments. Um, this is looking at the expected utilization growth based on demographics for each hospital and then not allowing growth under, um, for the um, avoidable utilization that we measure for each hospital. What you have been, um, you're going to be looking at is two recommendations. One is pertaining to aggregate at risk, so that's the QBR, MHAC, and the readmission reduction incentive program, um, determining the maximum penalties and rewards for these programs. So these programs are done on an attainment and improvement level. So one is looking at their rate, and the other one is looking at their improvement. Um, and in general, the the approach at HSCRC is determined these level ahead of the performance period. So for fiscal year 18, um, calendar year 2016 is the performance period. So right now we are in the middle of the performance year. Um, and the adjustments will go into effect in July of 2017. So um, keeping in mind that these adjustments will be for next July, not for this July. Um, the Shared savings and other adjustments that we do on the market shift are looking at the past performance period. So for um, rate year 17 that you will be discussing, what we are looking at is calendar year 2015 performance results, and then prospectively adjusting the budgets starting July of 2016. Um, so one additional change this year is on the readmission reduction incentive programs, we've been doing a lot of analysis to look at the, the way that we measure hospital performance. And um, for the um, kind of for a uniqueness this year that we may do some retrospective adjustments to fiscal year 2017 results based on those analysis. Um, there might be uh, last year when we were doing improvement program, we were concerned with some potential biases because of the socioeconomic adjustments or other factors that may impact those trends. Um, so the commission wanted to look at those retrospectively and, if necessary, make adjustments to the um, rate year 2017 um, adjustments. Do you have that data yet? Yes. Um, so performance work group, we've been working with them um, and looking at that data very closely. And here, what I want to bring to you is the payment implications and some summary of those analyses. It seems to me that in certain socioeconomic uh, demographic populations, it may be very impossible to expect that a chronically ill patient who's never availed him or herself of uh, adequate primary care intervention is all of a sudden going to, when they, upon discharge, uh, change their life, their lifestyle, their attitude towards uh, their health and what they need to do to contribute to, their, to a healthier lifestyle. And now that they may have access to 
to insurance through insurance because of uh, uh, Obamacare and Medicaid expansion that they may feel that going to the ER is the perfectly valid way to have their health needs met. Those people, to me, are very prime to be readmitted in a 30-day period and to penalize the hospital for that I don't think is fair, even in an era where many hospitals are employing primary care doctors, even if you assign a primary care doctor who agrees to take the patient because that primary care doctor works for your health system, you can't force the patient to go to the doctor in a week or two weeks for their first post-discharge follow-up unless you're going to hire uh, guards to go around and gather people and drag them into the doctor's office. So what have you gleaned from the analysis of this socioeconomic uh, stuff that allows us to make better predictions of how we're going to achieve a reduction in rate, which clearly is a goal because that's what we promised CMS uh, in this uh, metric. So um, <laughs> I was going to get to it, but I can answer it right now. Great. The preliminary analysis, we are looking at area deprivation index, which combines unemployment, poverty, housing, and all others. So it's, it's a good measure in terms of the demographic. When we do a patient level predictive models, it's a strong predictor. So the more deprived area you live in in the state, the higher your readmission risk, as you suggested. It's kind of corroborating that. But when you aggregate it at the hospital level, so when you sum those all up and then look at the hospital performance, the changes in the rate is not as significant because we already do a case mix adjustment. If you think about those type of patients, they have comorbidities and they are also one of the reasons why they have high readmission rate. So the case adjustment is already moderating the impact of that a little bit. On top of it, once you do those adjustments and then look at the improvement rates, the improvement rates are actually smaller. So what we are seeing in the state is hospitals with high socioeconomic challenges, they, their improvement rates are much higher compared to the hospitals where the um, patient mix is not that challenging. And and you could think about, you know, a lot of hospitals are doing transportation and other things that may address the immediate needs of that population. And what we are seeing is the adjustment actually helps them in terms of ranking them, right? If you adjust for socioeconomic uh, factors, their readmission rate is lower than without the adjustment. But when you look at their improvement, it actually hurts them because their improvement is um, narrower because of that. So um, the, we are still working on the adjustments, um, but in general, um, the, our issue that we have been dealing is that the, not about the socioeconomic adjustment per se, but if you have a low readmission rate as a hospital, how much improvement can you expect from that hospital compared to a hospital with high readmission rates? Is there any effort going on for those hospitals that have been successful in figuring out how to reach that population successfully to promulgate their success stories to the other hospitals who have similar populations so that, uh, you know, base ca best case type uh, approaches can be shared and mimicked? Um, yes, I believe MHA is leading a lot of efforts in that area and also the CMS uh, Quality Improvement Organization from Virginia is helping hospitals to have those kind of um, best practice learning network initiatives. Thank you. All right, thank you. No, this is great discussion. Um, so for the shared savings, as I mentioned, we started shared savings with our episode-based uh, payment model in 2014. And to ensure the savings to the public um, from these incentive programs, uh, and also at that time, to meet the requirements for exemptions from Medicare readmission reduction program, we instituted the shared savings a year after the ARR program started. Obviously, with global budgets now, the um, savings that hospitals could acquire is more than readmissions, right? Any, any admission awarded would be savings to the hospital. Um, so with the all-payer model, the measure doesn't necessarily need to stay with the readmissions. It could encompass more than the readmissions under global budgets. Um, as I mentioned last year, um, we were discussing the readmission progress, and the commission chose to keep it at the readmission 
rather than expanding the shared savings um, uh, measurement to a broader concept. And since we didn't have good um, socioeconomic adjustment, the protection on the shared savings was modeled on Medicaid percent of the patients. So we kept the negative adjustments to a state average if the hospital had uh, you know, top quartile of the Medicaid percent in their uh, patients. So this year, um, we are proposing to align the shared savings measure with the potential avoidable utilization concept. So with this, it will add the observation stays, uh, which last 23 hours or more, um, to the measure itself. And it will also add the prevention quality indicators. These are the um, admissions preventable um, if the patients are receiving better ambulatory care in the state. And, and also, in other changes, if you think about this as sharing opportunity under global budget, hospitals' opportunity is um, for readmissions happening at that hospital. So in, in, in general, the readmission measure that we are looking in the other programs, we are accounting the index hospital, the first hospital accountable for the um, readmission itself. In the shared savings, the concept is under your global budget, what percent of your revenue is potentially avoidable? So that would include readmissions coming from other hospitals to the, um, to the hospital itself. And this is in line with the general the concept of potentially avoidable utilization where hospitals need to go beyond their walls to collaborate with other providers in the state. And in general, um, majority of the readmissions are happening at the same hospital, so this impacts a few hospitals. But in general, um, whether you measure the sending hospital or receiving hospital, uh, for majority of the hospitals, it's the same um, percent. You, you look like you have a question. A patient comes into a community hospital and has an, a serious but not emergent situation, so it's not a direct transfer from that hospital to one of our tertiary or quaternary care institutions in our state, but arrangements are made that this patient who needs a very sophisticated surgical procedure, let's say, and is going to have it done at Hopkins or Maryland, and they're going to see the Hopkins or Maryland physician within a week and get admitted to have that procedure, that's certainly within a 30-day period. How are we handling that situation? They, there is a planned algorithm. If it is a planned readmission, they are excluded from the readmission count. Thank you. So as, as I mentioned, the potential avoidable utilization, in general, we are seeing unplanned care um, unplanned that can be prevented through improved care coordination, effective primary care, and improved population health. Um, so we, we think uh, with this definition, um, the three measures um, that we currently had in the PAU, we could remove the hospital card conditions from this measure and align it um, completely with the concept of uh, better um, care coordination and, and reaching beyond the hospital's walls. So if you take this broader measure itself, and we just want, wanted to give you a sense of where we are, um, so the medical admissions from ED are 54% of all inpatient admissions in the state. So that's kind of the potential, uh, from our perspective, the potential pool of avoidable utilizations. These are the unplanned coming from ED and mostly medical, so we didn't want to make a distinction on the surgical one. So this is a big pool of inpatient admissions that our hospitals are focusing now on their global budget. And the existing measures that we have, um, eight, readmissions is 18% of those, um, medical admissions from ED. Uh, PQIs are another 16%. And then staff's been looking at the sepsis cases um, uh, sepsis is the largest DRG in the state, and um, so and it includes 5% of these admissions coming from um, ED um, as in kind of unplanned um, admission classification. So we've been discussing in the performance work group about what we could do to reduce the sepsis 
cases in the state. And as you may imagine, um, the clinical complexity of identifying sepsis cases and the changes in the coding has impact on the trends on the sepsis. So um, we are going to continue to work with the performance work group to look at this um, um, in, the, in the next coming years. Uh, sepsis usually, but not always, has a known source of the infection. So does that person have is that person counted twice in the sense that A, they're septic, but B, they're septic because they have a lung abscess, a liver abscess, uh, uh, diverticulitis, and that's formed an abscess in the periclonic tissue? How are, you, how are they getting coded as far as this metric is concerned? No matter where the source is, if they are coding septi sepsis or um, septic shock, we are counting them right now to get a better sense of how many patients we have. OK, so you're looking specifically at those people in septic shock and not just to have a, a systemic infection from a known source. That be handled differently as far as the coding is concerned? I'm not very familiar with the coding, but I would think they are going to be coded as sepsis too. So there are two codes for sepsis. One is septic shock, one is septicemia. So those patients will be coded and will be part of this 5%. And they would also be coded as a, a known abscess, or is that you don't, you're not tracking that? You're just tracking when there's have septicemia? We have some discrepancies in coding, and we uh, really expect people to get it cleaned up this year um, because we, um, you know, we, we are going to do something with it. But there is some discrepancy, um, and and I, so I think you know the the work group wanted to spend more time looking at it and to uh, give people the opportunity to get it cleaned up without having penalties on it, um, if you will, if you want to put it that way, and. Um, but there's clearly a lot of, uh, of things that get coded as sepsis that are avoidable. I mean, diabetics that get infections, there's a lot of things that can be done to avoid infections in, in diabetic patients. That's an example of people who ha get uh, sepsis that where it could be avoided with better com community-based care and better attention to their condition. So I think that um, you know we'll, we'll continue to approach it this year but we're really encouraging people to get it cleaned up. Thank you. Question about the medical admissions that are coming through the ED. Do we have a breakdown as to how many are coming from independent living versus assisted living and long-term care? I'd love to have that data. We've been working with the Medicare and Medicaid to link it up and at least right now we are focusing on long-term care patients to see what that percent is. Yeah. That may be. Yeah help hospitals focus where they need to really put their community-based efforts. Mm -hmm. Great. And that will relate to the sepsis as well. And we really agree with that yeah. uh, very much, that that's a very prime area of uh, opportunity, both the literature showing that about 70 percent of those admissions can be avoided with uh, better interventions between, uh, between the parties. So another um, reason why staff is um, recommending to add PQIs into the shared savings is, as you know, you're going to hear that in the update factor discussion, our trends in Medicare utilization has slowed down last year compared to what we predicted historically, that 2% different statistics that we're going to get into more detail. Um, so for us to be able to ensure the Medicare savings, we really have to reduce the utilization for Medicare patients. And more than 50% of the PAUs measured both readmissions and PQIs are for Medicare patients. Um, so these charts are showing you the trends in the um, last two years. So this is a cumulative trend. So in 2014, the PQIs um, uh, measured as risk-adjusted um, equivalent admissions um, declined by 1.3% in 2014. And when you look at 2015 level, Compared to the base of 2013, um, there's almost 1% increase in the PQIs. And as you see, we are continuing to see a decline on the readmission um, uh, from 3.6% to 5% um, in two years. And um, in, in, in terms of total revenue, uh, we still have a lot of readmissions. Um, it's almost 8% of the total revenue and the PQIs would add 4% additional to the total PAU measures. Um, I should note that we usually take readmission first, as you can imagine. 
some of those PQIs could be readmissions. Because of our emphasis on readmissions, um, we are measuring the readmission first. So when you kind of do duplicate it, the levels could be equal readmissions and the PQIs as well. Um, so, in, so just to sum up the draft recommendations that will be um, put forward for the May Commission meeting um, is to align the shared savings measure with potential avoidable utilization definitions. And then um, secondly, to ensure that we focus on reductions in shared savings and also ensure the Medicare savings for coming year to increase the shared savings amount to 1.25% of total permanent GBR revenue um, and continue to have a cap for hospitals that have high uh, burden from the um, higher socioeconomic um, status of their patients. Um, so, the, so those are the three changes that, um, that we are um, proposing for the coming shared savings recommendation. <laughs> So that's kind of the end of my presentation. I think now we can discuss further the, both the measure side and um, performance work group has been discussing the measurement side also, but um, we also like to discuss the increasing the shared savings amount um, to 1.25%. So if you don't make any change, that amount is at 0.6%. So this is uh, doubling the shared savings amount um, for this coming year. No comment. Anyone on the phone? Can, Mary Jo? Can you, can you um, talk to the third bullet up there a little bit more? I'm not sure I fully understand how you're capping to the, to the relating it to the high socioeconomic burden hospital. So last year we did the same thing. So we measured the top quartile of Medicaid percent of patients. So if the hospital had very high levels of Medicaid patients, um, there is an association between their readmission rate and that percent. Um, so And they were getting much higher reductions in, in shared savings. So we kept them so they got the state average reduction of um, 0.6. So if we, um, so the, the average now is going to be 1.25, right? And our preliminary estimates are showing that um, some of the hospitals could get up to two and a half percent of their total revenue. So if you do the caps, then those adjustments will be lower to 1.25. Mike, do you want to come up here and join us? We'll let you have the hot seat between Shuli and me here. Come on up. I'm very excited. I want to make sure Mike Rob out of the He's going to come sit next to me. Um, if, you're, if you're online, it might be helpful to mute your phone because um, we're getting a little bit of echoing from folks uh, dialing in. Hey, Donna and Shulay, just a, a comment. And the term is called shared savings. It doesn't really calculate that way, right? It starts off with first dollars of re reductions in PAUs go to the payers. So it's really not shared. So it's not as if we calculate how much we reduced PAUs for in a year and do a calculation and decide what gets shared. It's really first dollars go out of rates. And if it's a 1.25%, if you believe that variable cost, in order for hospitals to give up um, 1.25, they have to cut their cost by 1.25, which means they have to, if you believe cost are variable at 50 cents, they have to reduce all volume in their hospital by 2.5 percent in order to just break even on paying the shared service. So 2.5 percent reduction in volume is 
really massive, especially when you consider it doesn't apply to all the volume coming into a hospital. It's just those that are avoidable. So I'm a little concerned that this number, when you put it in the terms of what effort a hospital has to make to get all of that volume out, just to break even on the calculation, I'm concerned. So I don't want to get into a formula, but just conceptually, it just feels that we're not taking into account how much has to get done before there's a value here to be shared. Well, it is. Uh, it's not. It isn't 1.25. It's an incremental. Uh, uh, 0.65. 0.65. Yeah. Because the other amount understand. was taken out previously, and so you know it's the third year of the model, and we should be having some investments now that are starting to reduce avoidable utilization. And so as we face the uh, the model. Um, we have choices of how to take reductions. We can take them off the top and spread them like butter, um, or we can um, we can uh, address them based on avoidable utilization. And so we're focused here on um, the, we're, we're driving a model that focuses on reducing avoidable utilization, and and so we're uh, addressing it that way in the model um, as. Uh, as looking at the opportunities for reductions and and addressing it that way in the model, so so that's the way it's addressed um, that we're proposing to address it in the model as a uh, as a policy issue, and um, and it, it was the approach that was um, uh, thought about um, when the um, the infamous lockbox was removed uh, from the project was to take reductions in avoidable utilization up front um, and then provide uh, opportunities through the, uh, through the uh, quality adjustments to earn it back and to uh, keep most of the money, a uh, 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 very high level of the money in the system for reinvestment. So I think I understand. that's the conceptual model and the, the policy is being driven through that that aspect of the model. I understand that. I'm just I, I would like for all of us to understand the size of this and what exactly has to get done by hospitals just to pay for this shared savings. And just I, I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's important that we not look at it and say, oh, it's just 0.65. It becomes it becomes a bigger challenge. It's significant, and it's the third year of the model, so we're hopeful that it's uh, uh, doable by the third year of the model that you've had uh, a run ramp of getting getting some of the investment dollars out there that were put into the rates. The, the payers last year said, okay, um, we, we, we uh, agree to put money in, but we expect to start seeing some, uh, some uh, um, reductions in avoidable utilization. Can, can you differentiate this shared savings from the Medicare hospital savings number that is required under the agreement? I mean, Medicare is getting their guaranteed savings. So how does this overlap or duplicate or compare with the $330 million that's required over five years? The um, the amount of savings that will be generated are based on the actual performance of hospitals. So the, uh, the savings that Medicare will gain will be based on what hospitals are able to reduce in terms of utilization. Right. But if, if we clearly, from the information you shared with us, have been generating Medicare hospital savings one of the sources of those savings has got to be from reductions in complications, avoidable utilization, and the costs associated to Medicare with all of that avoidable utilization. And so it would seem to me that there's a duplication of those amounts here. And uh, in fact, the fact that we are so far ahead of what the agreement required us to be in the first two years would suggest that Medicare is getting excess savings and they don't share that back with hospitals, 
if we beat that $330 million or that amount in any one year, they get to keep 100% of that. So where, where's the sh true sharing of savings here? If there's a, you know, that seems to me to su suggest that there's a concept here that whatever we save for Medicare should be, should be shared equally or some, in some fashion between hospitals and the Medicare program. Uh, the the uh, shared savings concept, uh, I wasn't here when you all came up with the name, but um, it's shared savings back to the payers from reductions in utilization. As utilization uh, reduces or is, is uh, supposed to reduce, there's some savings that comes back out of the system, and this is the piece of it. So that's uh, that's uh, what, what we've got here. And so... Um, um, but at the point in time that we came up with that concept, we didn't have the new waiver and its guarantee of $330 million in well, savings. We, the we definitely had the concept when we took the black box out of the, um, the final application. I, I assure you that that was the conversation that took place about uh, getting rid of the black box because we were expecting to have lock box. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong term, lock box. We got rid of the lock box. Um, which was kind of a, a black box, but uh, we couldn't quite figure it out. But um, it, the uh, lock box, we got rid of the lock box because we said we were going to reduce avoidable utilization and we were going to take money out of the system, some level of money out of the system when avoidable, uh, for avoidable utilization. And so that was the concept that drove the model forward and got rid of the lock box. I, I guess I'm just asking is I don't know how you demonstrate that you're not double counting these amounts. First in the Medicare overall hospital savings amount and second in the shared savings calculation. Could, could I just comment because I think part of what you said at the beginning was that this is a program that's intended to provide additional incentives at the hospital level to manage PAUs. And that's the, the, the piece that hasn't been accomplished successfully thus far. Um, you look at PAU uh, change and it's virtually flat uh, from 13 to 15. And that's part of the, the model and the, the dynamics of the model. Get the hospitals to manage PAUs, particularly for the Medicare population. Um, they generate some degree of savings. This ensures, this program ensures there's a sharing of some of those savings, which is not inherently bad. I think it's the right thing to do for the public. And then um, it also would, that dynamic would lower uh, Medicare utilization and also increase the difference statistic. So this all seems to make some degree of, of logical sense uh, and uh, you know help meet the goals of the waiver. Okay, but Bob, didn't you just prove my earlier point that it is not a shared savings? If there hadn't been any PA reductions yet, because we all know it takes time to make that happen. In fact, we haven't been sharing, sharing savings payer has been receiving the benefits, and we are still trying to make it happen. Uh, I disagree completely. Under a global budget, you reduce PAUs, you reduce utilization in the absence of this program, and the hospitals can keep 100% of that. Now, I think this creates a situation where there's an opportunity for sharing between the payer community and the hospitals, and it's completely appropriate. I, I, do, under, I do understand the system, and I do agree that it presents the opportunity. I'm just pointing out that the term shared savings, there, if, as you just said, if PAUs haven't changed in two years, why are we taking these reductions? I'm, I'm fine with changing the title. Let's call it the PAU Reduction Program. That's perfect. Let's yeah. just uh, so let's take the t title off I, there and I second call it that the PAU Reduction Program. And we don't have to call it shared savings if that creates confusion. Well, and, it doesn't and, create confusion. I, I just and, think and, it's... And then the question I would have is how, how do you differentiate then that PAU savings program from the separate complications program, readmission program uh, that are basically counting the same number in both cases. I could understand if the PAU program was just for PQIs, which is the new item that you put on the table. But right now there seems to be an overlap. They, so I actually, I don't know when, I didn't see you walked in, I don't know when you come in, but it, even on the readmission one, so there are differences between the readmission reduction program and the PAU. The major difference is readmissions are counting at the receiving hospital, because if the readmission is awarded, the receiving hospital is the one who would be saving that, rather than the 
hospital that is originating. The other differences are we are including observation cases, so we are handling the, the shift to the observation stays for the inpatient stays. And, and, and so those are the two major differences between what we are doing on the readmission reduction program versus what we are calling as a PAU um, in, in this program. But there's absolutely no overlap between the two? Well, they are, I mean, I'm not well, saying one, there are, in, they in are one, different. On one hand, we're taking the funds out up front at the beginning of the year for the PAU reduction. On the other hand, if you implement a good program, since we're not on a revenue neutral program anymore, if a hospital implements a good, good program, it gets a paycheck. So the MHAC program is completely in the positive zone now um, because people have gotten quality improvements. And so if there's a really great work with uh, readmission reduction, then people can get into the positive zone. So it is a, it is a different, um, it is a different um, uh, measurement. So we're, we're taking the savings up front for the avoidable utilization, and the hospitals have a chance to, uh, through their improvement programs, to get a differential uh, uh, um, uh, result on the other end. Can I ask a okay. question here just in terms of terminology? Because when you're talking about the shared savings program and the comments made, the payers benefit. Can you just help for a minute, because I'm you know, understanding. When you say the payers benefit, does that mean, what does that mean in terms of patients and cost to, to the system here? The purchaser's benefit. So it's a benefit to the purchaser. So if the, if, if the, uh, um, if, if the, the purchaser is a Medicare program, then the Medicare program benefits. Um, ultimately, that benefits the public through lower taxes and um, through lower co-insurance uh, 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 premiums. Um, so it benefits the public through the, uh, the, the purchasing aspect. And, um, and obviously, if we reduce avoidable utilization, the patient really benefits a heck of a lot because they're not being hospitalized with a readmission or an avoidable ad admission because we're actually providing better care. We're, we're trying to put more money into the doctor's office to provide better, more care in the doctor's office so they're not ending up in the hospital. So that's and, what and on the commercial side, aren't we also looking at reduced costs? I mean, when uh, you say the payer uh, benefits, uh, uh, well, isn't it's it? It's the purchaser. It's the purchaser. purchaser. So okay. absolutely, on the on the on the on, 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 on the commercial well, that's the, on the commercial that's side. Where I'm trying to get on the commercial side. About sixty percent of the business is uh, is ASO and it goes straight back to the, the businesses that insure the patients mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and in about 40 percent of the case it's based on the premium and um, and and so um, uh, you you'd have to get in the premium setting to get to the bottom of that but um, um, and certainly the co-pays, we looked at co-pays and people not affording co-pays, the co-pays are direct savings when we, uh, uh, to the patients. But 60 percent is a direct pass back. Thank you. Medicaid is a direct pass back, uh, not, that's uh, not to the patient, that's to the state government uh, budget. But it's our, our tax money that pays the state Medicaid uh, program and the federal government. And that's also the tax money. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. And it, whether, yes, and what, uh, whether it's actually those exact PAUs or it's the 50% um, of patients admitted through the ER. So, I mean, basically, um, if you look at 50% of the patients admitted through the ER and do that as a, you know, use that as your denominator, um, that'll start to get you the, the percentage. So, sure, we could do that.
All right. Amy. Just one, one last question here. I, I, for the last few years, we've been increasing the amount for this, what we're now calling PAU program, by about two-tenths of a percent per year. You're now proposing to increase that with your, your latest version of this model uh, by an extra 0.65, so three times what the incremental amount. What's the thinking behind increasing it to such a large amount, particularly when we're bringing t two items into this model that we haven't used before, or at least the PQIs that haven't been used before? They have been wouldn't wouldn't a, a, a more reasonable or measured approach be, uh, since we're bringing a new concept into how we're implementing a PAU program, that you do something closer to the incremental growth we've been using in past years? There's, there's several things. One, last year, when putting money into rates for avoidable utilization, the commission said that they expected to see some progress. Um, two, the different statistics is closed down, and that that's creates issues for us. Three, ACA has 0.75% offset, so the federal government is accelerating reductions against the Medicare update factor, and and um, we have to we have to look at that and see how we uh, our model is based on the model that was approved for Maryland was based on the idea that if you have an all payer system transforming care delivery that we ought to be able to do it faster than the um, than the country and so the way that we to be able to do it faster is by reducing avoidable utilization through better patient care. And, um, and so that's how we're proposing to implement the approach in Maryland to reflect what, was, uh, what we believe was expected in the model that, uh, that, that we set up here in Maryland. Yeah, except as I understand the model and the way the agreement was written, was in these first couple of years, there was really little expectation of savings, of having this, this avoidable utilization reductions occur, because the, I believe CMMI knew how hard it was for this work to take place and to achieve the results. And we now have two good years of data where we know we have far exceeded what that agreement required which should give us some cushion to at least be a little more conservative as we implement new changes in this program with how much revenue is being set aside. I also would take exception, given that level of savings, to the statement you just made that in addition to trying to incent reductions in avoidable utilization, which no one would disagree with, we're also doing it to beat a national hospital savings rate, and we can spend a lot of time here today, and probably will, arguing over are we beating that national rate and just how much do we have to beat it by given the savings we've accomplished in the first couple of years. So I don't think anything to do with this program should be tied to where we go with the overall hospital rate. This should be re related to incenting reductions in avoidable utilization, not to achieve some bottom line target of savings. If that was, that to me sounds like what we used to do with the old waiver, where we did a so-called policy adjustment in order to end up with a waiver cushion at the end of the year. We wouldn't do it through this program. So I would take exception to the fact that if you believe you need to take account of the 0.75 that the national system is reducing out of its payment rate, uh, that it be done through this program. This is not the way to do it. This should be about incenting avoidable utilization reductions, not to achieve a dollar savings party. I, why not both? I'm, I'm sorry, why not do both? I'm not sure why we should separate the two. 
and make sure, you know, share, you're going to see the shared savings number in the update. So, you know, we could discuss there in regard to the overall general numbers, but why not hit the two birds at, with the same stone? Chula, can you just remind us what the 200 million translates into percentages? So the 200 million that's been built in every year to the infrastructure yeah. development. Oh, um, point one point. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't. Uh, I have to run the calculator. <laughs> I just did it. Point two five. One point two. Well, no. Yeah, I think it was probably mm -hmm. more than this. One. So we build that. Yeah, it's about a point. 1.3, yeah. 1 1.4. 1.4. So at some point, you would expect yeah. some type of regression right. in the rate. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, uh, why not use this for both purposes? I, I, you know, this is a this is we're at a situation now where we had great performance in calendar year 14. It's deteriorated. Performance deteriorated in calendar 15. We have a total cost of care issue that is mounting. Uh, it seems best to take proactive action at this point to to try to to rein in the rate increases that have occurred, including the 200 to close to 200 million dollars in infrastructure payments, and to to try to jumpstart the incentives for hospitals to manage a p potentially avoidable utilization more effectively than what has taken place over the first two years. Those all seem like reasonable policy goals and, and certainly care for supports that. So do we, do we, we can keep going back over this, but we should move on in the agenda. Fine. Yeah, we'll come back to it in, in the update factor Donna, discussion. I, I, I'm sorry, but I think we need to be careful of terminologies. Okay, we're going to drop shared savings because we now have acknowledged it actually is not shared savings. Bob, you want to use the word incentives, but there's actually penalties uh, associated with it. I think we just need to call these things what they are. If there are investments, as Hank said, that we're making, if we can't make the numbers, we've incurred the cost uh, to do so. Uh, again, I support taking shared savings because it's not a shared savings program uh, for us, but we, we need to be careful when we say incentives, but you're, you're taking money out of rates. That's, that's a penalty. But incentives, if you look at the, the lexicon of, of, of I mean, behavioral have, economics, incentives include both positive and negative, and, and we're, I just want to—we're moving to the negative reinforcement side, where I think we all believe coming into this we would be on the positive reinforcement, and we've made some very positive strides uh, collectively together. Uh, I just feel there's a, a, a tone shift occurring, uh, uh, and I'm not sure whether it's warranted to have that tone shift, uh, and we'll get to that when we talk about some of the things. Obviously, there's a cumulative effect of that in the, uh, in the when we get to the update pack. Could I just pick up on one other thing, because I don't know if it's clarified and if I was listening on the phone, that the aggregate amount that's at risk, including now this one and a quarter percent for the PAU program, over 9 percent that you're showing in your, your, your information here, that's at risk, I, that is on an all-payer basis compared with the Medicare numbers that you were comparing them to, which not only were less, but obviously just for Medicare. So I would suggest that that's also an indication that we have an, an excess amount beyond what Medicare, in fact, is requiring. Why we would need to go to this extra level from point to point two every year we've been doing to the 0.65 incremental growth when in fact we're already significantly above where Medicare is for the re for the rest of the country. Well, if you want to if you want to compare that if you want to compare that to the minus 0.75 and the minus 0.8 off of the um, the uh, update for Medicare, and that gets that gets taken on to Medicaid nationally because there's something called a UPL. So. Uh, Sixty percent of revenues nationally are subject to a negative adjustment of 0.75 and point to point six or point eight. Well, the, the productivity is 0.5, and, and the and ACA is 0.75. 0.75. Yeah, right, right. So that's a point uh, a quarter. Right, but that was that was an adjustment made to fund to fund.
fund the ACA program, it had nothing to do with avoidable utilization. I'm trying. So, so, we, well, well, so you're, 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 what we said is if we don't take those out, we do have to have avoidable utilization in Maryland. So if we didn't subtract them off the top, we still have to have avoidable utilization in Maryland in order to keep the numbers in line. Yeah. But let, let's go on and look at the numbers. So it might be actually helpful to look at the numbers. Right, and I actually was going to present the totals um, on the aggregate. Of the the all-payer contract requirement is our aggregate at risk on an all-payer basis has to be equal or higher than the national adjustments in Medicare. So even though we can, you know, we agree that you know we are, ours is on an all-payer basis, Medicare is Medicare specific. The agreement says that those percent would be comparable without any adjustments to the denominator. So if, if we are doing 6% in the Maryland programs, that's compared to a 6% in Medicare programs. Um, so the numbers you have um, from year to year, what you have is in fiscal year 2017, so this doesn't build in the increase in the shared savings yet, um, we have 9.26% total aggregate at risk compared to the national 5, um, 6 percent. So cumulatively, the difference between Maryland and the national program is at 5 percent. So on an aggregate at risk, potential aggregate at risk basis, our, our revenues are at much more risk than, than the national program. So there are differences between Maryland and the national programs. As you see we here, we have the absolute numbers. So in general, our numbers are more positive than the national. Um, so for the national one, um, the hospital acquired conditions is negative one, readmissions is negative three, VBP is revenue neutral, so positive and negative two percent. So with the test, what we are doing is we are not looking at the signs, we are looking at the absolute percent to just say that what percent of revenue is tied into value-based purchasing. And, and CMS gave us the flexibility in whether we do a positive or a negative adjustment. I'm not going to go through it. Um, this is kind of the glossary, the way that we do the scaling. But this feeds into the actual adjustment. So what you looked at, the potential. So on the MHAC, if you remember, we have a 3% penalty. Um, so in 2016, that was 4% potential at risk for MHAC. So I'm looking at the potential at risk, absolute value for percent in slide 28. So that when we do an improvement versus attainment, the actual adjustment, the maximum penalty that we have in the MHAC program is at 0.21 percent because we had a great improvement in one year. And then when we do a preset, since we do point-based scaling, it's not relative. The potential at risk is reduced to 0.21 percent reflecting the improvement performance in the state. Then what you have is the maximum hospital reward is at 1%. So one hospital received 1% uh, positive adjustment. And when we add all these adjustments on average plus and minuses, the average adjustment in the MHAC program in 16 was at 0.18%. So, you know, the potentials look big, but when you get down to the actuals, you know, you get the much reduced impact on, on the revenues because the way we structured our scaling and also incentivize the improvement more so than the attainment. So then the bottom line for the MHAC program in 2016, we had um, a net adjustment of 6.7 million and majority of it is a positive reward. On the readmission reduction program, this was the first year where we only had 0.5% bonuses for hospitals achieving the target. So that resulted in 9 million revenue adjustments. On QBR, it was revenue neutral, so we have no net adjustment. And the shared savings, that 0.2 additional um, that we have resulted in 27 million reductions. Um, and the PAU adjustments are the, the demographic adjustment that we do reduce the growth rates is about 26 million as well. And when we sum them all together, net impact was 20, 38 million um, reduction in the state across all um, five adjustments. 
And the last column is the net for one hospital. So if you think about one hospital scoring the worst values in all the four or five, that will be the, the additions, um, that maximum hospital penal, penalty, 2.59%. Right, if I add them all together. But you know the, the performance varies from the hospital to hospital. Um, so one hospital received 1.95% total penalty across all the five adjustments that we have as a net. So the um, CMS is measuring the 7.76 on the top as potential, but they're also me measuring the actual adjustments because of the differences that we have in our programs so they are paying attention to the average absolute level adjustment, which is 1.95% um, of the inpatient revenue. So this next chart is the year to date. Um, a similar chart, and I'm not going to go through the, the all of it, just the shared savings side. We could take a look at the, the shared savings is um, modeled with 1.25 as the total adjustment, and column E is the net, so that 0.65 additional adjustment that we are making. Um, so with that, the average absolute level adjustment is reduced from 2.6 to 1.6 um, for um, across the hospitals. So at the bottom, you have the total net adjustment. So this year, MHAC is producing 28 million additional um, adjustments, positive adjustments, um, 29 million. Um, the readmission reduction, we have the 2% penalty uh, maximum with 1% maximum reward. So what we have is 27.8 million reduction in readmission program. And QBR, this year we changed the scaling, so now QBR is also a positive adjustment rather than revenue neutral. So our preliminary analysis is producing 28 million additional bonuses in the QBR program. Um, and the shared savings, you could either look at the total, 188 million, or you could look at the net at 100 million. Um, so that will get us up to a statewide total of um, 159 million, which is about 1% of the total GBR revenue. The um, one caution I would like to make is these percents above our percent inpatient, because we are measuring percent inpatient against the national. Um, so that's why I added the total GBR at the bottom. So if you're really looking at the overall revenue impact um, from the update factor discussions, I think you should look at the total GBR revenue rather than the inpatient as a, a percent. So in the draft recommendations, we are recommending not to change any of the adjustments we had from last year, keep the MHAC at 3% maximum. Um, and readmission reduction at 2% and QBR at 2% as well. Um, in addition to these, we have a protection for a hospital. Uh, if the hospital performs worse in all of the three hospitals, you could imagine the, the financial impact is, is, is large. So to protect that unforeseen financial impact, we have a cap for the total maximum um, not to exceed 3.5% of total hospital revenue, and this is the Medicare amount, 6% um, that you saw in the uh, earlier comparisons converted into a total hospital revenue. Um, and, and finally, to align some of these adjustments, um, staff draft recommendation included to apply some of these adjustments only on the inpatient revenue side uh, to room and board um, uh, rather than spread it through all the rate centers, and this could be a technical adjustment that we can uh, work with MHA to address as well. Oh, so I do have the, I'm going <laughs> to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go through, we, we discussed already a little bit um, on the readmission reduction program. I covered these. Um, so this chart is looking at our, so I'm on chart 23, 33, excuse me. Our progress versus the national progress. As you know, we, we are required to reach the national level by the end of the fifth year. So what you have here is the national readmission rate, which is the red at the bottom, um, and the Maryland Medicare readmission rate at the top. So when we started in 2013, our rate is at 16.6% .6 compared to the national estimate of 15.3%. 
39 percent. Um, so our progress has been better than the national trend in 2014 and 15, but you notice the national trend changed. So they, um, the Maryland is improving faster, but also the national rate kind of seems to be leveling off. Um, so that factors into our progress and success in, in the readmission reduction program target. Can I ask a question on that, that national rate? Do we have any understanding of why, when they put an increasing amount of revenue at risk in their program, that would level off? Why wouldn't we expect, if you put more money at risk, that number to go down? The observation to midnight rule is kind of changing these trends. That's my understanding. And in, in general, you know, hospitals may have opportunities to shift. And when they started, they started only with three DRGs, right? They are not measuring all the DRGs. What they are measuring is heart failure, pneumonia, and yeah, one more, but the right? Increase in the national program, the amount of revenue they were putting at risk. And I'm just trying to ask whether we have any understanding of why the national number would be leveling off when they've been when they've been incented to reduce their readmission. Yeah, I'm saying they're incented to reduce only in the three DRGs, not all. This is covering all DRGs. Right. Right. But even with those three DRGs, are you saying that they've gotten to the point where they can't reduce any more in those three DRGs? I don't think so. Yeah, I was just gonna say I think it's five DRGs now. Didn't right. they move it yeah. to five? Right. But yeah. but at the same time, if you're if the point of your question is oh, we're reaching the point of, of not being able to, the, the hospital's not being able to reduce readmissions. I would say that's that's not true. You look at other developed countries, Canada in particular, other states, and readmissions are far lower there than they are in the United States. I think what you, you're really missing the point I'm making. You have evidence in the national system that they put increasing, not only with numbers of DRGs, but dollar amounts at risk, and yet it's leveling off. Maybe it's not enough. I mean, well, the, I'm there's an emphasis on value at, at if, the if CMS we're level. In incentives to, to incent behavior, do we have any understanding of why nationally all the other hospitals it's leveling off and we continue to reduce it? What is your? Well, I, think I would that say what what we're one of the things that we're measuring is if you use the global budget instead of having people lose a hundred percent of the revenue every time they get a readmission out. Right. Huge um, that, that that has a different impact, the potentially different impact on the amount of money that can be invested and on the results of the approach. And so that's one of the things that with this new model that we're uh, measuring is the. Uh, the, 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 the global budget and the population-based uh, approach to, to, to the uh, situation. And so it, it, we see the same, so the, the, the theory is that if we had a managed care company, that they would be able to get down readmissions. Kaiser Permanente can get the util avoidable utilization down. Um, and now, so by using global budgets, we're providing the same uh, financial support and incentive system for hospitals. So we're uh, hopeful. Um, in fact, that's what we were, were betting on with the model, that we could demonstrate that we would be able to do better with the model. Um, but, but there are other factors, as uh, Bob pointed out, with the two midnight rule that affects uh, some of the national trends. But also, um, fundamentally, they don't have the same uh, economic uh, result uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the day. So if, if they are focused more on five DRGs, that's not the same amount of focus that the Maryland hospitals have. I don't want to, you know, complicate things, but the national program is structured differently too. So they are using historical time period rather than improvement. So hospital, whatever their readmission rate in the past, lost those revenues. So they don't have much improvement in terms of that current adjustments that they can improve their readmission rates. And on, on top of it, they are penalizing only the top quartile, right? They are not, it's not a continuous adjustment across the board. They are targeting really high readmission hospitals. That may also limit the impact on the national number. There's an important difference in the national, too, in that they don't adjust for socioeconomic status at all. And they, they know that socioeconomic status contributes to readmissions. It is the lead predictor and everything that I've done in most of the literature, but yet they, as a matter of policy, will not adjust for it. So 
if the you know that that could be influencing this too. And that that was the question I was asking. If we had any research that could explain, because ultimately the question on these quality policies is for us to understand what level of incentive, whether that's negative or positive, is going to. Excuse me. Yeah. What I'm trying to understand is whether there's any kind of research we can use to let us know what kind of or the, 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 the magnitude of an incentive that actually drives improvement in performance. And that's, uh, that's what I was trying to get at there, that it seems to me that if they have very limited incentives, that may be why it's, lev why it's leveling off. I was just trying to get at an understanding of that. It, it could also be that incentives are not the only thing that change behavior, <laughs> and that there's other factors such as uh, culture and available programs and just the fact that we're all meeting here and it's something that you're focusing on. Uh, so I, it, point well taken that just putting in incentives is not the only thing that drives behavior and change. And ER at the GCRC focused on the incentives so you would see that our discussion is always heavy on, on the financial side and um, I know MHA does a lot of work on the learning action networks to get the behavioral impacts in. If you don't mind, um, I would like to finish the deck and so we can get to the update factor discussion. Um, so the, the issues that we've been looking at in the readmission policy is whether we set the rates on the Medicare on an all-payer basis because our target is on Medicare um, and but our programs often have been on the all-payer ones. And um, staff doesn't see an issue this year um, that we are advising to keep the targets on an all-payer basis. Um, then the issue whether the hospital who is doing a good job in reducing overall, re -admission, overall admissions, are they negatively impacted by the readmission reduction? If you think about it, their denominator is getting smaller. Um, is, does that have any impact on the readmission? And we found that there was no evidence um, for that relationship. In fact, if hospital is reducing overall admissions, they are also uh, more likely to be reducing their readmissions as well. Um, so the, we talked about the socioeconomic and demographic factors. Our work is still continuing on that one. Um, the observation stays. If you factor into observation states, our level of improvement is declined by one percentage points. Uh, but in general, the trends are still positive even if you factor into observation state um, at the hospital. And, and finally, the issue that we've been um, trying to address in the current recommendation is this issue of uh, hospitals with low readmission rates having less opportunity to improve. Um, so these graphs um, quickly showing um, the relationship between the base year readmission rate, which is the x-axis, calendar year 2013 readmission rate, and the y is their percent change in the two-year period that we are measuring. And in general, what you see is as you move towards a higher readmission rate around, you see an outlier at the 20% um, readmission rate, they improve the most almost with 20% decline. So there is some relationship um, between the base readmission rate and the improvement rate. Um, however, the socioeconomic adjustment complicates this factor because we can't really know the low readmission rate. Is it low because they have a different patient population than not? Um, so with the performance work group, we are addressing this issue, um, and then we may recommend some changes to the um, 18 and 17. MHA has been working, um, and we appreciate um, their work, as well as Care First also brought some solutions to address that problem uh, in the program. Uh, and the current thinking is, could we add an attainment so we could rank the readmission rates of the hospitals if you find a way to adjust the um, socioeconomic adjustment or do 50-50 uh, care first uh, presented a 50-50 approach, take the 50% of adjusted and 50% unadjusted, and then rank the hospitals and, and look at the best of the improvement versus the um, attainment. Um, so we are still working through that modeling, um, but um, I think in the past month we did a lot of progress on, on this issue. Um, so if we do this, um, so the, the issues that um, we would like, um, the staff recommendation, if you move to an attainment model, um, the, then the targets or the benchmarks need to be set at a higher level than the state average. As you'll see 
um, the Medicare rate, admission rate is higher, so we don't think the state average would be a good benchmark to judge whether the hospital has a lower or higher readmission rate. Um, the staff would be proposing to use the top quartile as a benchmark um, and also set another readmission reduction target um, at 9.5%, um, looking at a three-year uh, cumulative period. Um, so with that, if we do a, an adjustment to the fiscal year 2017, that will factor into the update uh, numbers because right now, um, as you see in the fiscal year 17, year to date, there's about 29 million penalties in the readmission program. Um, and if we make some adjustments, that number is going to go down um, and we need to factor that into in the final recommendation for the update factor. I, um, so in terms of, should we, um, just in terms of the market shift real quickly, um, I apologize, I know I'm running quite fast and these are very technical and complex issues. I just wanted to share a couple slides on the market shift adjustments. As you know, we worked on this last year in terms of methodology and we didn't make any changes to methodology. Um, so the first year adjustments were based on six month period. Um, that was looking at July to December 2014 levels. And the blue line here is the percent growth in volume. Um, and the red line is the market shift adjustments that we made for each hospital. What you see here is on the declining end, the adjustments, positive, negative adjustments are closely related to the declines in the uh, utilization. But on the positive end, you see there is a gap between blue line and the red line. So the market shift adjustment did not cover all the increases in the utilization. And if you remember, we had the ACA um, and increased utilization during that period, and hospitals were funded uh, for the Medicaid expansion um, to cover some of that gap between the um, red and the blue. So the bottom graph is showing the most recent 12-month um, period. So this will go into the fiscal year 2017 rate. And here you see the relationship is much closer. So the, the numbers, they are not the same hospitals. So I just ranked them, so they are not the same hospitals. It's just the, the number one is the one that had the most decline in each period, and they are different hospitals. What you see is the, the uh, relationship between market shift adjustment and the utilization growth is much uh, tighter this year. And, and we think that's because the ACA had an impact in the earlier time period. The current timing of these adjustments is 12-month um, period, um, and, and staff received some comments about the need for doing these more timely. Um, so the current uh, schedule that we have is we look at the calendar year 2015 growth, and then that goes into the rates in fiscal year 2017. So there is, uh, you know, if you just think the first quarter growth, there is like a year and a half wait period for us to be able to make those adjustments. Um, during the year, we get requests from hospitals who are experiencing uh, big increases in their volume and market shifts and requesting to do more um, current period adjustments uh, rather than waiting until the end of the period. Um, so that's something that we would like to have a discussion about what, you know, if there are things we could do to make this more timely. Obviously, the global budget concept is to have the fixed revenue so you plan accordingly, and then the more we make adjustments during the year, the more challenging it becomes um, to have those uh, programs sustained and implemented. On the other hand, uh, some of these adjustments are um, quite large and, and impacting the hospital operating uh, margins uh, throughout the year. The, um, um, I just put it there, if there is a closure or an opening of new services, obviously those are handled separately, so we do those adjustments uh, immediately. Um, so this is about really looking at the policy and the calculations. And then the biggest challenge there is the data throughout the year. HCRC staff had issues with the timeliness of the data or accuracy of the data. Um, so the numbers are also changing because of the data submissions throughout the year. I guess I can just quickly take comments on the market shift adjustment timing and other things. I just add time, just one quick comment, and that is, uh, as I understand it, when we adopted this policy, there was also an understanding that 
at the time you were ready to make that adjustment, hospitals, if they had a particular issue, could seek some amelioration by, by meeting with staff and providing information. So if we move to a quarterly adjustment, would you then anticipate more of those kinds of meetings where hospitals would say something happened in this quarter that in, in the, under the original policy, the, the, the current policy, you might have only had to adjust once a year, but now that you're going to be adjusting four times a year, hospitals coming in with things that happen throughout the year that get fixed by the end of the year, like they, they lost the physician, they lost some market share temporarily, but that comes back up by the end of the year. But now when we do it on a quarterly basis where you're going to have more of those ups and downs to have to address. Yeah, I think we are a little concerned with quarterly. So we, we'd like to speed the process up and we are definitely uh, wanting to do you know, six months, but quarterly might be excessive. So we actually do want comments on that because it, it does, uh, it creates more, it, it also creates more potential for random variation because the small, the cells get smaller. Um, so so there's, there's definitely, there's definitely some, um, some, and, and you have uh, event driven variation too. Um, that 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 can happen in a in a in a in a single quarter. So I think there's definitely um, uh, some concern about quarterly um, being too frequent, perhaps. But uh, looking, but we could uh, can still make adjustments more timely. I, on the PU adjustments, you know that's a good point too. We have a few hospitals that we interacted with, but in general, I don't. You know, we encourage a prospective information about what your PEU reduction programs, what the potential impact, so we, at the end of the year we have a sense. I haven't received any requests in terms of the PEU exclusion, so I'm hoping um, we released the data and we gave about three weeks for that kind of information to trickle in. So if you do more semi-annual or other things, it might also help in terms of staff perspective on reductions in utilization. Without that PAU information, um, staff is challenged to really know whether it's the market shift happening, that the, there is a timing issue, or there are some interventional progress and improvement happening that, that's related to PAUs. Just a quick comment. You know, we've, we've been on record saying that we had some concern about the stability of the market shift adjustment. Um, there's the issue of timing. I think there's also the issue of predictability of, of the adjustment. So we're plan to present a, a paper that has some recommended modifications to the market shift adjustment that hopefully will get at, at all those issues to try to make it more uh, predictable, stable, and also timely with regard to the adjustments. Um, but, but we would not be in favor of moving to a quarterly adjustment for the reasons that you mentioned. When would you be uh, submitting this paper? Um, um, we will probably give it would it be in the next enough several time days. That we can actually potentially, yeah. Review it we, and implement we've it. We just finished the paper, and, and I I, it's almost hot off the press, Jerry. I'm, I hope we get it to you, um, like in the next day or two. Yeah, as, as you know, we Mike, we've had uh, a number of hospitals approach us on this uh, market shift adjustment, and uh, those who were incurring the cost are saying uh, waiting 18 months mm -hmm. to get these adjustments. Uh, uh, is, is a significant time period, and it's having impacts on their on, on their bottom lines. Right. And I, as you know, we only hear from those who are actually having increases in market shift, not decreases. So we're trying to address this in a more timely manner for everyone. Right. I'm so. not trying to belabor that. I'm no. not arguing that. Uh, yeah, just want to. There's a difference between getting the information quarterly and then necessarily saying you make adjustments based on that information. I wouldn't want to restrict the flow of information. <laughs> on a more timely basis, but I appreciate the comment about, but how will you use that information? We, us using it internally could be very helpful for us to see exactly what's going on. And Mike, as you mentioned, sometimes these are individual physician moves or changes on physician behavior that if we, we're seeing, if we continue to get that information, we can analyze it more appropriately and decide when it is appropriate to come in and have a discussion versus overreacting to just the uh, movement. Thank you. Um, so I think with that, we could move on to the last topic on the agenda on the update factor. Thanks. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time left, so I'll go through this real fast. 
Uh, we have had a few changes to this uh, since our last meeting. One of the things we've received is a new uh, uh, book from Global Insights. Uh, as you know, that uh, that is the basis of the Medicare adjustments that are made. And Global Insights now using the, those numbers in the way we have in the past, it's reduced the update to 2.49%. Uh, we then uh, looked at the average error rate over the last three years, and it's been pretty consistent at about 0.65, about 0.6 percent. That is, their estimate every year is about 0.6 percent more than what the actual number turns out to be uh, once all the numbers are in. So we had decided to try to do a better job of making that estimate this year, and we've applied the average three-year uh, um, <clears throat> difference to the uh, to the expected update at this time. That produced an update number overall of 1.92%, and that's on page three of this draft recommendation. Um, when we apply the, AC, uh, the ACA adjustment of negative 0.75 and the productivity adjustment of 0.5% to that 2.49, uh, the update number that we're recommending for um, for revenue that's not under the global budget, and that's basically some out-of-state revenue, 1.24 percent, and for the psych hospitals and the pediat Mount Washington Pediatric, we're recommending about, uh, I think it's 1.55 percent. Um, they show that's the, the main number for, for the hospitals under the global budget shows up on this table, uh, two, and it's one point. Uh, 92 percent less we're going to withhold a 0.2 uh, percent uh, and we're going to try to do something with allowing additional revenue to hospitals who uh, who have increases in high cost drugs uh, we're in the process of working with that uh, with, with uh, different people and we're going to come up with a recommendation for that uh, last year we provided additional money for grants uh, for partnerships that was a quarter of a percent that money for different reasons was not provided over uh, the course of last year. So we're going to include it, though, in this year's update. That number will be provided to hospitals. Um, I believe we're going to be implementing it July 1st, possibly before that. But that's a quarter of a percent. Uh, there's a half a percent reduction, I mean, a half percent increase for volume of all type. And that's taking into consideration demographic adjustments. Uh, transfers, addition, increases in transfers to the academic medical centers, and increases in categorical adjustments. Um, that's a, there are also these other adjustments uh, on the positive side that we, we're, <clears throat> we're making. I mean, on the negative side, there's a half percent holdback uh, as we had in the past. There's another 0.6 percent for the increase in the workforce program uh, that Hopkins had recommended and it was approved. Also, there's another 0.07% increase for uh, for Holy Cross, Germantown, and that's for uh, for for a new for the new hospital. Uh, we've heard a lot about all the other reductions uh, for shared savings, prior incentives, positives, negatives, incentives. That equates to 0.61% overall. The total increase in revenue that we're estimating is 2.72 percent, and the per, with a per capita increase of 2.19 percent. Um, there are a couple other adjustments again this year that do not affect the hospital's uh, financial position, but they do impact uh, the increase or decrease in the revenue in total or per capita. They are a half a percent. We're rec we believe there's going to be a half percent reduction. 0.55 percent reduction for uncompensated care. Shule spoke about that, and then there's another adjustment of a negative 0.15 percent, and that's for a decrease in the deficit assessment uh, that is paid to the state. Uh, that there was a 25 million dollar reduction to that amount this this year. Uh, that would be a reduction to rates, but it has no impact on the hospitals because they'll be paying less over to the uh, state. Um, one of the main thing that we've tried to take into consideration then is how this type of increase will affect us on an all payer basis and on uh, and on the the uh, waiver test itself. And so, <clears throat> what we tried to do is estimate the impact of this on the waiver test. So, if we go back to page 
10 and 11, we talk about you know what what are our uh, what what are our limits under the waiver test, and we have a couple of things that we have to do under the waiver test, and that is one we have to beat the uh, all payer rate of growth of 3.58 percent per capita each year, and if you look at page 11, we estimate that amount to be 13.12 percent. Um, our actual projected per capita growth for that time period is 6.4 percent, and that looks really good, but you have to remember that some of that is due to things that don't, have not impacted the hospital overall, reductions in uncompensated care, the elimination of the MHIP program has reduced uh, payments total revenue to the hospital, but it should not have had any impact on the hospital's overall financial position. So when you take those things into account, uh, if you added those back, if they didn't occur, the increase would have been about approximately 10 percent over the, that time period uh, through 17 we're projecting. It's Jerry, Jerry, just one quick item there. Um, all the other amounts are on a per capita basis, mm -hmm. but your UCC assessments to me appear to be on a total revenue basis. I mean, to be correct, shouldn't that also be done on a per capita basis? We should probably, yes, we should convert I'll look those. at that and fix right. it, yes. So it, it would be a, le uh, uh, it would reduce that 3.23% that you have there if you do that. We're going to add another table to um, Mike, uh, some, some other folks that we should add a table with the gross amount so people could understand the gross okay. revenue. So we're going to have a 5A and a 5B, and we'll fix that and, uh, and have a, a, a gross table. Gross and net, I mean gross and per capita. Do you mind uh, explaining to me exactly what that means? Adversely impact hospital bottom line. So if your bad debts go down, and we take it out of your rates, it doesn't really affect the hospital. Um, so we're not going to count that as uh, if you want to put it in. I, I hate to use the word savings, but we're not going to count that as a hospital savings because it's it's going. The revenue is going down because we took the money out of rates because the cost went down for uncompensated care because the Medicaid expansion occurred. So the state is paying for those and the federal government are paying for those enrollees. Um, and so when we take the money out of rates, it doesn't have a negative impact on the hospital's bottom line. Does that make sense? Like charges are reduced, but net revenue did not change because of those two. Right. The MHIP program, too, just for your information, that was a program where money was put into hospitals' rates. Hospitals collected those dollars and then paid them into to the Medicaid program Okay, for, for high at-risk patients. And now, because of the ACA, they've eliminated that MHIP program. Okay, so the amount that the hospitals now have to pay to the state is less, so we take that down to the hospital's rates. It should not have any impact on the hospital's bottom line. They don't have to pay it anymore. Correct. Okay. So if the final thing that we wanted, I think, go over today as far as this update goes is uh, how, the, how our projected increases uh, from page three will impact us on this all waiver on this waiver test, and specifically on the Medicare savings portion and the guardrail portion. And so, um, if you go to page 13 of the recommendation, uh, <clears throat> we're now trying to predict what impact, you know, what, whether this rate increase will help us get to the point where we need to be on the overall Medicare waiver test. And uh, we we done two things here. One is we projected Medicare growth based on the actual change last year, that was 1.2 percent overall. Um, <clears throat> we need to save approximately a half a percent per year, so that would uh, indicate that we need to have a maximum uh, growth rate for Medicare for beneficiary of 0.7 percent. Uh, in the past, last year we looked at what the difference was between the overall growth rate provided to hospitals and the, and the Medicare growth rate that resulted from that total in, uh, change. Last year there was a difference of approximately 2 percent, and that was built into the calculation. We see there's been an erosion in that this year, over the year. We now believe that that uh, difference is about 0.89 percent, and uh, we have asked Dr. Cook 
to uh, provide us with an update on that number, and he did so. That paper, I believe, was distributed to everybody on the group, and so as part of, <clears throat> so I'm sure you've, had, hopefully, you've had an opportunity to take a look at that. Jerry, I judge you ask a question. <clears throat> as we're getting into these savings, can you have you released the actual um, calendar year 15? Um, final forecast or preliminary data from Medicare, National it, Medicare, it, and Maryland Medicare? It's not released or final, but the numbers are reported here. Some preliminary figures are reported here. So they're reported here in the, um, um, on page. Yeah, I didn't see them. I went through 11. here. Page 11. Yeah, so we we de we've definitely included them here, but they're preliminary. They could change. Um, so the yeah, but had so, to that so, hundred thirty-five so, million. So, so there, the the hospital growth in Maryland is a hair under the hospital growth nationally, one tenth of one percent. Calendar fifteen. On calendar fifteen, yes. So. So that creates a savings. And in the non-hospital side, um, there is a growth of about 60 million above the national rate. So there's a, a, a so overall, just for the one year period, there's a, a growth above the national average for the one year. But for so the, the 135 million is really based on the great performance from the year before. The carryover large right. from the year before. It's the way the model works. Right. Well, no, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just asking for. But, but it ended up, so far, it ended up subject to whatever adjustments people might make in the claims still. Um, it's ending up uh, uh, a little bit under. Right. right. Do you expect to have a final um, no. number for both of those sometime before the, the June meeting to, to show the public and the commissioners sort of where we stand officially? Mm -hmm. This is going to be pretty official as, as much as we can. I mean, this is better than last year when we didn't have the ability to release it. We didn't get a release until October last year. So, um, but we should, uh, I, I think the release is due from, from Medicare. I think it's July 1 is their official release date. But we'll, we'll have, uh, we have the data. It's unlikely to be much different than this for the June meeting. I'm, I'm not expecting it to be a lot different than this for the June meeting unless somebody finds an error. We think it's... Uh, well, all, all we were asking for, though, is you, you've got the, the savings, the results here, but what was the like the numbers, you know, what was the trend? Okay, the, the trend change. statistics. So, so you would like us to add that to the document? I think it would be helpful. Add the trend statistics. For both total cost of care and the Medicare hospital. Is there any way to get a breakdown, not now, of the um, outpatient, uh, the non-hospital services, that 60 million and others, is that mostly nursing home and we don't have to ha ha yeah, Half of it's uh, post-acute and half of it's um, non, uh, is uh, Part B, which is uh, in the Part B portion is primarily doctors. and. Um, in the doctor side, we're, we're just drilling into the doctor side now. We've been drilling into the post-acute side with and sharing some data with the hospitals. And we're just getting getting our legs under us and getting into the non-hospital side. We do see some increases in a, a number of, uh, of uh, uh, physician uh, payments. And we're, we're looking at those to see what they are. Um, I have a question on uh, on page 11. You make reference to cumulative savings are ahead of the required savings of 49.5 million for two years. If you're looking at 330 million over five years, that's like 66 million a year. How do you get to? What am I missing? There, there was a ramp up period. So basically, the federal government said if you can keep it at the same as the national growth rate in year one. So it's, a, it's an increasing savings uh, trend that, 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 that was uh, negotiated in the, the so way. So it's, it's back-loaded ultimately? It's not. It's, it's, it's mid-loaded. So next year it, it jumps up to over $100 million. So it, it, it's a... So 
So the, the, mathematicians, in the, the, math, is of some concern, maybe? the mathematician Dennis wouldn't like the little schedule that that were the, that were the, that had the savings on it, but uh, it, it's uh, it's mid loaded, so it uh, actually jumps up in the middle and then it kind of tails off in the in the back end. So. Uh, the the one thing that we were trying to look at, the, and I think we were, when we left off, we were talking about uh, the difference between the overall uh, rate increase and that, that uh, Medicare would uh, incur based on that rate increase the expected, and uh, that again that was on page 13, and uh, we used two different ways to try to estimate what the Medicare growth rate would be. Uh, they both here on this page. Uh, Based on these growth, these this difference now that has eroded from two percent to 0.89 percent, um, you can see in the first scenario at top the uh, the overall increase of 2.12 uh, percent revenue growth and the 1.6 per capita growth uh, keeps us uh, uh, within tolerances of what we expect to occur. Uh, the other one doesn't necessarily. I don't know whether Jack Cook was going to talk about Don, this. Yeah, that's good. Maybe have him make a few comments. Do you want to have him make the comments? Um, it's here we thirty. Maybe just very, very briefly, because we so, so that we can yeah, Jack, get back there? into discussion. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you could just make a few comments about your the calculations that you did for the different statistics, because we're running way behind. Uh, sure. Um, in an initial paper, which is discussed in the paper that was distributed, um, we had calculated um, the different statistic for the purposes of making sure that if we uh, that we could meet the two tests of the demonstration at the same time. And they're a little bit tricky to because the Medicare waiver test is dependent on a number of statistics that we don't know, whereas the all-payer test is essentially predetermined and, and, and pretty clear. So what um, the paper did was it, it first of all, attempted to re, uh, replicate the initial calculations, which were estimates that depended solely on um, HSCRC charge data and which used a uh, indirect way of counting for fee-for-service beneficiaries. And it was that calculation which Jerry refers to in which the conservatively projected difference statistic was 2%. Uh, so the first thing in, in the paper that we did was we tried to rep replicate that, again, using just uh, commission data and uh, commission staff were very helpful to to me in working that out. Uh, 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 Claudine, Sule, and Kai all uh, did great work, and uh, so we re we recalculated uh, the different statistic using the um, using four years of data up through 2015. Now, of course, we're in a different situation now because we have the demonstration in operation and we do have access to Medicare data from 2013 to 2015. So we attempted to corroborate the results that we obtained using just commission charge data by looking at the Medicare payment data. And um, essentially, we found that for the period from 2013 to 2015, we had reasonable corroboration, and that using the Medicare payment data and the actual weighted number of Medicare beneficiaries, that the uh, different statistic was 0.89, which was slightly less than the amount that we got when we used the uh, the uh, charge data of the commission. And the the power of this statistic is if if you posit that it is essentially correct, then you can look at what your standard is for meeting the Medicare test, and Jerry's shown that that's 1.2 less a half a percent for savings at 0.7. Uh, that gives you your expected, your, your projected or ideal level 
of increase in Medicare hospital claims per fee-for-service beneficiary. You then increase that amount by this statistic to get to the increase in hospital claims per Maryland resident. You then additionally add to that the growth in population, and that gives you the maximum increase uh, that you can uh, give while at the same time having a reasonably high probability that you're going to meet your Medicare waiver test. That's just one point about this methodology that I want to emphasize because it's a little bit tricky. And that is all of these calculations and the Medicare waiver tests themselves are based on calendar year data. And in order to ensure that the Medicare waiver tests will be uh, met, we have to keep in mind that the revenue increases of the hospitals in calendar year 16 are going to be the consequence of two adjustments, the fiscal year 15 adjustment and the, then the amount that the commission approves in July 1 uh, for, for July 1 of this year. And so uh, it turns out that because the prior year, uh, prior fiscal year increase was relatively high, it will have an effect on the amount that can be approved for the first six months of um, of, of this fisc of uh, I'm sorry for the first six months of the next fiscal year or the last six months of calendar 16, which are the same thing, in order to meet the Medicare uh, savings target that's been established. And, and just to that point, we handed out a, a chart that illustrates what Jack's talking about here. Just looking at uh, as staff in their recommendation, they've correctly calculated out the, the overall all-payer revenue increase that would be required to hit the, the, the Medicare hospital for beneficiary expenditure growth in calendar uh, 16. However, um, if this is the basis of the update for July 1st, 2016, fiscal 17, what Jack's saying is you have to take into consideration the fiscal 16 update, which I've just, I don't, we don't know what the total amount of revenue is. The overall approved revenue was 3.19, uh, subtracted off the 0.25 of transformation grants, which are being delayed to the following year. But um, it, to get, to target a, a 2.01 or 2.11 amount for calendar 16, you have, you'd have to take into consideration six months of that 2.94. Um, and so that the update at least for the first six months of fiscal 17, would have to be low enough to offset that to come in uh, to meet your, your goal of achieving the Medicare savings for hospital for beneficiary. So we just wanted to illustrate that. And again, we don't know, you know how this is all going to sort out, but would, would one possibility would be for the commission to start out with a lower update, see how things are going, and then January 1st, if we're meeting our targets, um, you know, revert back up to the 2.01 or, or whatever. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Jack. Okay. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Have a good day. have a good day. So these were the things we wanted to at least get through on this update factor uh, for today. Um, Donna, where are we going next with this? I think just, uh, probably opening it up for discussion, and then just you know, also to to comment on 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 Bob's uh, point about the first half, second half. Um, I mean. If we if we if we got comfortable with an overall number and we needed to allocate it between the first half and the second half, we do have the mid-year targets, and so we could actually allocate first half, second half um, by using the targets. Um, that right now we just take 50% of the approved revenue for the vast majority of hospitals, so we could change that a little bit. Donna, I was interested in the answer you gave, uh, Jim, about uh, the Medicare promise of $330 million over five years. I, I too, had assumed it was $65 million a year. I was feeling really good about 
what we have achieved. It, it, since we're probably over the 200 million mark of, of that 330 by our, our performance through year two, if we don't meet $100 million in year three, and I think that's what you said we're supposed to meet in year three, but we still add to our 200 plus million dollar goal, are we going to be some kind of put on notice by Medicare that we didn't meet what they said? Are they going to look at the aggregate? I mean, what's the metric they're really following here? It, it's a cumulative calculation, so it, 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 it looks at the past plus the current to come up with the, the uh, aggregate. So it's 49 million plus another 49 million. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not 149 million, it's 100 million. So it, it does look at, it doesn't forget that you had savings in the first year. Um, on the other hand, um, you wouldn't want to be moving backwards. It, it wouldn't. We still we we still have to get our um, uh, our model renewed, and and so um, we we wouldn't want to be moving backwards in the savings calculation because that wouldn't be. Um, if we view Medicare as a buyer, that wouldn't be a very impressive approach to say, look, we saved money in the first year, but now we're moving backwards. Um, uh, re renew us up. So, uh, you know, I think we're wanting to be continuing uh, good results and not, not moving backwards. I just had um, a couple of questions. One, um, I the the way this is being described here in the terms of trying to compare this to the all payers feeling of 358 that's if you look at this on a one year basis but isn't in fact the way the agreement is written that it's a cumulative basis and that's the reason why you put this chart in here I mean what's the purpose of looking at this cumulatively if in fact that's not the way the agreement works I mean it seems to me that uh, while we don't want dis savings in this model, we can look at the fact that we've got cumulative savings, $200 million more than what's required. In fact, if you take what's required by June 30th of 17, that number is around $190 million. So technically, we already have saved what this agreement would require us to save for the period through June 30th of 17. And that's why I have a problem on page 12, where in the first paragraph, you, you use the 0.5% savings in this model as an annual amount without giving any credit for the prior year's savings. You say that by using the 0.5%, attainment of this goal will both maintain any ongoing savings from prior periods and help achieve savings in the total cost of care. I'm reading here on the top of page 12. Yes, we're not, we're not building but a model to go backwards. I, I understand that, but, but isn't it in fact correct that if we generate a 0.5 savings below the national growth rate, that in fact we will increase the rate of total savings, not maintain the ongoing savings? Because if we just grew at the national rate, as we, you know, slightly beat it in this past year, but we still saved $134 million the way this agreement works. So, in fact, by targeting 0.5%, we will increase the amount of ongoing savings beyond the, the $250 million, the rate of $250 million we generated in the first two years. Wouldn't that be a more accurate statement instead of saying maintain? Uh, not necessarily, Mike, um, because uh, it depends on what happens in the non-hospital cost. So, well, now you're talking about the total cost of care. Well, that that statement was uh, was was brought there, but um, the uh, the uh, so so I, th I think it, it it if you uh, if it, if you look at the total cost, if you we we targeted a 0.5 savings last year, but guess what? We didn't get it. We got a point one. Uh, we we were lucky at, in, at the end of the year, and we got a point one. So I'm very uh, grateful that we uh, stayed uh, flat uh, to the tune of about point one um, improvement, and not point five. So that's what we targeted. 
and um, and, um, and 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 so we 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 were uh, fortunate on the hospital side not to go backwards, but we did go backwards on the non-hospital side. Um, so I think we're focused on maintaining a. Uh, point five, because our model is based on saying that we're an all-payer model, that we should be able to transform the delivery system um, uh, faster than the uh, the states where we don't have all-payer models and uh, where we don't have population-based approaches. So we're uh, carrying that point half objective uh, forward. Um, in, in the model uh, year after year, um, and if we, if but we doesn't that then ignore the fact that we exceeded the 0. 0.5, which accum cumulatively is a little the, over one percent? We exceeded they, that in the first two years. Uh, I guess. It, so it, where, it, where it, in it, this model it, do you give credit for those savings? If you look at savings, Medicare is not saving money by having a waiver in Maryland. And so this is really what they require for us to demonstrate that we could uh, that we could improve care delivery faster than the national model. And so we didn't say, oh, if we get over it, if we get over 330, you're going to give us the money back. Right. We said we would uh, that would be the minimum amount of savings required that 3.58 would be the maximum amount of increase that would be occur that would occur. We didn't we didn't uh, enter into an agreement that said we will only get 330 million dollars of savings for the federal government um, over over five years, which would equate to let me just let me calculate what that would equate to. Um, compared to the funds that they're paying into the state. It's it's uh, not 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 a lot of money. But the agreement says three hundred thirty million dollars sa cumulatively it, saved. It's a, at least at and, least. And the way the agreement is written, it expected zero in the first year and forty nine and a half million cumulatively by the end of the second year. So we don't take any credit for that excess savings in the first two years as we look at how to produce savings in years three, four, or five? Can I um, volunteer something, uh, perspective maybe? Um, the way I understand this process, uh, Maryland has a uh, global budgeting, or I mean a, a uh, hospital rate setting process that equalizes payments for all payers. And that means that Medicare is probably paying more, that Medicaid is probably paying more, and that I am probably paying less. And so uh, the way I understand this process, Medicare is saying, look, we are already subsidizing this program in Maryland. Uh, if we're going to continue to subsidize this program in Maryland, which as a private payer, uh, I think we benefit from, uh, we want to see some savings on our side. Um, and $330 million is probably a relatively small piece of what they're subsidizing my payment. Um, so well, they're not subsidizing; they're just not cautious. <laughs> well, same thing, from my perspective. All right. Um, so the idea, you know, I, I, if we can give back to Medicare more than than three hundred thirty million dollars. I'm all for it. That's where it I and just to build on that, I, I really think it, I take issue with the way you refer to the three hundred thirty million as a requirement, as it as if it's the minimum amount that we have to do. I could tell you that's foolhardy to go back to Medicare and 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 just peg the three thirty over five years in the context of over two billion dollars per year additional that they pay. So you can compare that three hundred and thirty million dollars to about ten billion over that five year period that Medicare is paying additional in Maryland. And so I, I think you're exactly right, Jim, that, that we shouldn't be quibbling over providing uh, a, additional savings to Medicare and trying to tri titrate this down to 330 and write it right on the edge when we're going to be filing an application to extend this, this uh, waiver for another five years in phase two. That's all reasonable, and I'm certainly not averse to uh, saving, saving 
Medicare money, certainly, and the system money. But um, I think we're focusing uh, um, uh, a little too much on money for my comfort. Um, because the other side of this is we need to make sure that we're putting the right amount of money into the system to be able to achieve the kind of changes that we're talking about achieving. So let's not get too caught up in the dollar figures alone. Um, we need to think about what's an appropriate amount of money to put. And we've made, I think, some really nice forays into putting money on the table, whether you call it incentives or negative penalties. Um, well, but, you recognize but, that the commission did step forward last year and put $200 yeah, million dollars additional money into the rate setting. And that's system great. For exactly that purpose. Sight, let's not lose sight of the fact that it does it said save last money, several save years. money. Um, and we just need to target that money. That doesn't mean we need to say, oh, goody, we saved a whole bunch of money more than we had expected to save, so we ought to, like, you know, kind of throw it back the wind, but it does mean that we do have more leeway than we may be acting like we have to have targeted investment in um, improvements in the system that we really want to accomplish. I, I can support the idea of targeted investments in the system. The one question I have, do we have enough knowledge of what may be influencing prices and utilization, not only in hospital, but sort of downstream? so that we know when we're putting investments in the system, there's some way of influencing it. For example, the question that I asked about where the um, you know, uh, readmissions are coming from, independent living, sub, you know, sub, uh, assisted living, or, or long-term care, that makes a difference in terms of what a hospital can influence and what not. If you talk about outpatient um, utilization or, or treatments by physicians, are we talking about a shift in cost of particular treatments? Are we talking about a shift in numbers? Um, of people having those treatments? Are they treatments? Are they diagnostic um, um, services? What are they so that we can get a sense as to where we could put the investment to, to, to reap the savings? And if it's in fact being put in the right place? And as, as this conceptual conversation is underway, and it's for me really wonderful also to step away with from the exact dollars for a moment. Um, so thank you, Sue. Uh, you know, when you tar targeting, you know, targeting where the money goes, that the money be in the system, and of course you all know that one of the things I represent a number of physician groups that are looking to try and transform, create new efficiencies, new models, and so I just applaud that because we're hoping that there's room for investment in those physician-led initiatives as we move forward. You know, one of the one of the things I'm concerned with is not what's where the inflation factor starts and all. It's the 0.5 that we're taking out for the total cost of care of what may happen because of what we've seen this year. And I think that that's a little bit premature uh, to do because as um, as hospitals have have implemented programs and tried to put their programs in place in order to uh, reduce the overall cost and put them into the appropriate setting. There has been some increase in, in the long-term care that to say that that's going to continue, I don't think is a, is a fair statement because there has been as, um, while, nurse, while hospitals may believe that the patient needs an additional amount of time uh, so to avoid the readmission, nursing homes in some cases have been taking the liberty because of the Medicare rules that allows them to keep patients longer than what the hospital may be expecting is going to happen. Those rules have changed this past year with, with, the, with the Medicare emphasis now on the nursing homes of what they're willing to pay and the readmission uh, amounts that they're willing to, to put in place. There's going to be a lot more collaboration between the hospitals and the nursing homes. And so to assume that that's going to continue to, to go up, I think, is, is um, not, not a reality that's probably going to happen. You also have the fact that the nursing homes and the hospitals are, are going to be working closer together because of or nursing homes needing to reduce their admissions and readmissions that they can avoid. So previously that's been on the hospitals to try to do. And I can tell you, we've, worked, we've been under the TPR system for six years. 
not just the two years of the GBR, and have been working closely with the nursing homes in trying to change some of that behavior. We haven't been as successful in that um, we, we have been more successful in reducing the readmissions as opposed to the medically avoidable admissions because at this point in time, the nursing homes still benefit from those people coming into the hospital and going back into the nursing home because of the Medicare skilled days. And that's going to change. I mean, that's how they're being incentivized. So, I, you know, I, I am concerned that, that um, we're, we're looking because of an increase that happened this year. We're preparing for something that's going to happen, you know, in, in the future on a total cost of care perspective. And I, and I think that we can be foolhardy in, in doing that. There's a lot of costs going on right now, not just from, not just from the overall investment standpoint of, of under the, of under the um, global budgets. Uh, but there's also a lot of pressures. You know, we, we know what's going on with drugs. Forget just the oncology drugs, which I know that you're, that you're trying to address. But inflation on drug costs this past year has gone up 8%. It's expected to go up another 8% next year. Pension costs are going up because of the changes that the federal government has made uh, in, in the actuarial tables and that type of thing. It's not the time. And and in trying with the alignment with the physicians, it takes time. It does produce results, but it does take time. And I think we're making adjustments too quickly you know, to, to see those things through. You can always back it down, but, but you're going to put hospitals in a financial situation by cutting back there, and they're going to get into a choice of where to invest and how to invest. And we're not going to overall, we're not going to see the ultimate results that we can if we, if we cut too much now. We have other uh, comments. The, the witching, it's the witching hour of. Uh, could, could I just ask very quickly? Um, so you'll have draft recommendation for the update at the the May commission meeting, and also for the shared savings, um, there'll be a separate recommendation with with a um, quote modeling of how it's being. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. That would be for the May meeting as well? OK, great, thanks. So does readmission and aggregate, they're all up. They're all going to be in the agenda. Aggregate at risk, we have an update on the draft okay. for readmissions and aggregate at risk as well. OK, so you'd want testimony on the readmission as well? I mean, I should, I should let me rephrase that. They are you drafts. <laughs> <laughs> they are drafts. The finals are in June. Yeah, OK, all right. Well, um, I think you know. I, I certainly agree uh, totally with Stu that the whole focus really is on patient care. But we do have to come up with an update. So, so we, we do have to do the dollars and cents. Uh, we have to account for the money. But um, it, you know, the uh, emphasis of the model is on improving care, and the staff has certainly been focused on uh, on uh, helping the process to focus on improving. Uh, care and um, and there are some blank lines in the table that um, that uh, Jerry just went over because we hope to continue um, as uh, as uh, time passes to be able to make additional uh, allocations toward um, uh, care improvements and and um, I think we, we have to work our way through balancing the budget. Um, but also, we do need to continually keep our eye on the fact that this is a major time in history, and we have a model that uh, allows that is uh, set to allow us to improve care, and in doing so, to generate uh, the opportunity to reinvest in uh, in uh, the care delivery system. So I think it is a it is a balancing act, um, but um, but that that is clearly the, the target of the model. Um, that's why Medicare is investing in the model, is they're wanting to see the care delivery improvement. They definitely wouldn't be investing for the ROI that we're giving them. And they are looking for the care delivery improvement. So I mean, I think that's the, the bottom line of what we all uh, have to demonstrate, is that we can improve the, the care with the model that we have. So thank you.
everyone for a, a long, uh, laborious meeting with a lot of details. <laughs>